When Kingsman The Secret Service exploded on cinema screens in 2015, I was among the many people who felt it was not only just a breath of fresh air, but a 12-litre scuba tank of 100% pure oxygen being pumped into my lungs. Finally, it felt like after around a decade of big budget wide releases taking a more subdued and grounded approach to spy fare, here was an audacious film that embraced outlandish gadgets, larger than life villains, oh my god what did I just see action, and for the most part, audiences seemed to lap it up. On a budget of between 81 and 94 million dollars, the film grossed just over 414 million. It received great reviews, and I think that that first film has genuinely had a lasting impact. It's one of those films that people remember fondly. It's not something that people just saw and then forgot about, uh, largely because the film is so shocking in a few places I don't know how anyone could forget some of this stuff, but hey. Director, producer, flat cap enthusiast Matthew Vaughn has been talking a big game ever since Kingsman's release about the cinematic universe potential of the brand, and indeed we have had other films set in that same universe, but I don't think I'm being unkind when I say that none of the follow-ups have had quite the same impact or staying power as the original for perhaps a multitude of different reasons. Uh, in this video we're going to be discussing the second Kingsman universe film, and so far the only direct sequel to the original, Kingsman The Golden Circle. A film about I might be so bold as to make the, I guess, quite unpopular statements that I actually quite like it? Good evening. Good evening, fans of both Oxfords and Brogues. Back in September 2017, I was one of the many with my butt firmly planted in the cinema for the eagerly anticipated follow-up to Kingsman. And to be honest, one of the more overwhelming feelings that I came out of the cinema with was the surprise at how much of a direct sequel The Golden Circle was going to be. I had fully anticipated this series going down the classic Bond route, you know, putting Tara and Egerton's rough diamond spy Eggsy in new situations, new allies, new villains, new love interests. I was totally expecting this to go down the individual episodic adventure route. So when it's revealed that Eggsy is still dating the princess that he sodomized at the end of the first film, when Edward Holcroft's Charlie reappears after seemingly getting his head blown up at the end of the first film, when Colin Firth comes back after being shot in the head in that previous film, I was slightly taken aback, and I do think that these choices are somewhat representative of the fact that this film does seem to have a broader MO than the first film, but I'll I'll get into what I mean by that after we talk about the plot. The Golden Circle sees the Kingsman intelligence service we know and love from the first film all but completely obliterated in the first act, leaving only Eggsy and Mark Strong's Merlin alive. The pair follow a trail of emergency protocol steps to Kentucky, where they meet with the statesmen, notably comprised of their leader, Jeff Bridges' Champagne, and then there's Halle Berry's Ginger Ale, Pedro Pascal's Jack, and Channing Tatum's Tequila. Quite the all-star lineup so far, isn't it? But it doesn't stop there. Eggsy and Merlin must now work with the statesmen, who it turns out have resurrected Colin Firth's agent Galahad with nanobots, we'll talk about it, and now the Motley crew must find out who was responsible for the destruction of the Kingsman and why. Turns out Julianne Moore's Poppy Adams is the one behind the heinous act, due to the fact that she now employs Charlie from the last film as a henchman, and he also has a cybernetic arm to complete the look. So Poppy's scheme is essentially to force her way into legitimacy. She is the world's biggest drug manufacturer and distributor, and has secretly added a toxin into her drugs that gives people a veiny blue rash and ultimately kills them. Her threat to the US president is that she will let all of these people die unless he provides her with immunity from prosecution and legalizes drug use. She will then distribute an antidote that will cure all of the blue vein affected people. There's a bit of a strange subplot that goes into, I guess, the ethics and multiple sides of this. And, uh, I mean, Christ, Emily Watson, a really wonderful multi-award winning actress, is here in a totally thankless role. And again, we'll talk about her in a bit. And Oh yeah, Elton John is here as a prisoner of poppies. Uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, the Kingsman and Statesman must team up to stop Poppy causing the death of millions around the world. As you'd expect from a Kingsman film, there is a whole lot of truly fun, really out there action. It all very much operates in Matthew Vaughan heightened reality. At times it can feel a little like Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner are gonna pop up at any moment, but I do say that with affection. I do get the sense that people are perhaps a little bit tired of this somewhat cartoony, artificial shtick based on some of the reaction that I seem to argyle, and while it's certainly not as pronounced here as it was there, it is still very much in that territory, to the extent that you could tell me that this whole film was filmed on a green screen in London and I'd believe you. I was shocked. Shocked to see in the behind the scenes stuff that they actually shot an awful lot of location stuff for this film and they even preempt the criticism in some of the on-set interviews. We were there and Pedro and I were in that cable car and we sort of looked at each other, it was baking hot, we were in these ski suits 
in the most beautiful place in the world. And, I, and we sort of turned to each other and went, no one's going to think this is real, are they? But anyway, I want to start by talking about some of the things that I actually really like about the film, starting with Taron Egerton as Eggsy. Now, I really, really like Taron Egerton. I think he's a very charming, very charismatic lead actor for these films and for plenty of other films. I think I've seen pretty much every film the guy's been in at this point, and I always find him a really likeable screen presence. And honestly, it pains me every time I see a poster for the Kingsman films where, you know, his name either isn't even on the poster or he's like third build. And yeah, I get, you know, Colin Firth, Julianne Moore, they're bigger stars than Taron Egerton, sure, but for God's sake, he's the star of this bloody series. But regardless of contractually obligated credits, I think he's a really fun lead for these films, just plays it exactly how it needs to be played, not exactly winking at the audience, but in that traditional Sean Connery fashion, I think that there is a level of knowing to his performance that fits the tone of these things wonderfully. He's given another character arc too, this one in relation to his commitment to his girlfriend. Uh, I, I can't say, I'm just going to get this out now, I can't say that I'm a big fan of them bringing back Hannah Alstrom's Tilde from the first film. Look, I thought the character worked fine in the first film. She is a punchline. She's a gag to end the film on as a send-up to classic Bond films, right? Like, she is a princess for the hero to save and then he can- We can do then the asshole. But that's all that I ever thought the character would be. I would never have imagined that she would return and that she'd become Eggsy's serious girlfriend. And yeah, I mean, a big element of the Golden Circle story is Eggsy's commitment to her and him trying to earn the approval of her family, who are, of course, royalty? I find these tangents a little jarring and they have me questioning what movie I'm watching. Maybe they could have been weaved into some of the theming a bit better. I mean, the first film is so much about Eggsy going from this rough chavy type to someone who's more polished and I guess that this is the next step up that ladder of class aristocracy kind of thing. It keeps him as a fish out of water in this world, but it just feels a little half-baked. This is a near two and a half hour long film, and I could have done with at least 20 minutes less, and I would have saved at least 20 minutes by cutting all of the Princess Tildy stuff. But then, to be honest, I'd probably have just given those extra 20 minutes saved to Julianne Moore, who is my absolute favourite thing about this film. She's a villain in the Stromberg Hugo Drax mold. She has global ambitions. She has an awesome lair. I love that she's just obsessed with 1950s Americana, but as the movie points out, it's kind of the 1970s, 1980s nostalgia for the 1950s that she really likes. American graffiti, Greece, that kind of thing. She's nostalgic for another era's nostalgia, I guess, and I just think that that's a really amusing little distinction. But yeah, I could spend way more time with her and her goings-on in this place. I love that she plays it as this squeaky clean mom next door type but she's actually this drug baron and she has no issues with just the most extreme violence. The scene that introduces her is one of my favourite in the whole film and I think it really captures the anarchic spirit of the first film really well where you're just like are they going where I think they're going with this? I think they're gonna pull it back any second surely like oh nope they're still going for it oh my god they've gone for it. And speaking of things from the first film coming back uh, Colin Firth is here so we finally get our A Single Man reunion with both him and Julianne Moore on screen together. Huzzah! I'm a big fan of that Tom Ford film. Um, anyway, Colin Firth is another of my all-time favourite actors. I absolutely love the guy, and as Harry Hart, he is still a delight to watch. He's a bit out of step for much of the film, and he's slowly collecting the pieces of the person he was as the film goes on, but him and Eggsy storming Poppy's base at the end is such a terrific sequence. I love seeing Firth in an action-heavy role like this. But wait, Colin Firth got shot in the head in the previous film, so how could they possibly bring him back from that? Why, with nanobots, of course, the spy movie screenwriting get-out-of-jail-free card these days, it seems. They're nanobots. Right. So yes, as much as I may love seeing Colin Firth back on screen in this part, it does come at a bit of a price of stretching what is achievable in this Kingsman universe to a place that I, I don't think I like very much. In the first film, his character's death is such a gut punch, such a whoa, anything can happen moment. Yes, it's very much part of the Campbellian archetypes that the mentor character will be removed from the events of the story in some fashion so as to put the hero in a situation where they must go it alone, but just how it plays in that first Kingsman film is such an awesome moment. It's sad, of course, but it ultimately contributes to Eggsy's vengeance at the end when he triumphs. To just bring the character back into 
the fold via some really contrived screenwriting nonsense is a double-edged sword. Yes, I love having a brilliant actor back in a really fun part, but now this becomes a universe with much less of an edge. It's a universe where death doesn't really mean anything because short of being put through a meat grinder, which the film doesn't shy away from to its credit, anyone can be brought back. I was really interested to hear in the behind the scenes documentary on the disc, which is over two hours long by the way, and really awesome. I miss when films have this level of care and attention put into their extras. But anyway, in that documentary, Vaughn talks about his reasoning for bringing the Colin Firth character back. It didn't feel right not having Harry Hart in there. I just didn't. It, it felt wrong. It was hard enough not having Sam Jackson back. You know, he was really, really missed on set. And um, I was, I thought, you know what? Sometimes in life you can push boundaries. Well, no, I think that. But sometimes you have to, to, to um, take a risk. And that stuck out to me quite a bit because the risk to me was killing him off in the first place and continuing without him. In the first film it felt like a daring move to do that, it felt like the gloves were off, and bringing him back feels, if anything, like they're trying to play it safe, like they can't even conceive of doing the film without recreating that same dynamic with him and Taron Egerton, and I guess, you know, they could just bring back everyone for the next one if they like them enough and they want them around on the set because they're fun to be around. It made me think of like movies like the Casino Royale spoof from the 19th 60s and a variety of Blake Edwards movies and how it you know it's just a party and you enjoy the films because there is this recurring cast you watch the films to see them do their turns and it's all just a big laugh for everyone involved and the audience are just invited along for the party. I certainly get that feeling from Elton John being here above all else. I think it's a very funny gag that Poppy made the most of the Samuel Jackson villain scheme in the previous film that while there was all the chaos going on she sought to kidnap Elton John and keep him captive for her own amusement and uh, you know what, I do actually think that Elton is great here, I really like all the stuff with him, but I can understand why some might find it gratuitous, and it certainly lends credence to the notion that the Kingsman series is, at this point, one big lovey party. Like I say, I guess that's what Matthew Vaughn is turning Kingsman into with this, and I just didn't feel like it was all that precious about these things. I think that the callousness of the first Kingsman film is one of its standout qualities, so when characters do die in the Golden Circle, I just feel kind of like, well, <laughs> I guess if they had fun enough on set, they'll probably just be back if they want to make another one. The first film felt to me like it was doing something, you know, Game of Thrones is my go-to example for something like this, but it, many films and TV shows do it, but you know, the idea in Game of Thrones that just when you get a bit comfortable with whatever the status quo might be, they do something really shocking, they kill off characters in unexpected ways, and it shakes up the whole thing, and all bets are off, and if done right, it can be really gripping. And I thought that the first Kingsman film was doing that, but what the Golden Circle tells me is that, oh no, actually we're not doing that at all, it's just a bit of a lovey fest, and we can contrive any reason we want uh, to bring people back and you as an audience are, you know, presumably gonna love this because, oh great, it's, you know, a bunch of the faces from the first film are coming back. But what it does for me is that, you know, I, I, I come away just not really caring all that much about the life or death stakes. Sophie Cookson, for instance, she's back from the first film and taken out of the picture very quickly as a missile destroys the Kingsman facility, but just how it's presented really bothers me. Like, yes, the explosion is huge, the ground caves in and everything, but we never get a shot of her body being incinerated. The last shot we see is of her running out of the room, and it's one of those things where, I guess, if they wanted to bring her back for the next one, they can just say that she ran into an escape pod or a Crystal Skull-style lead-lined fridge and survived the explosion that way and then decided to lay low for the rest of the film's story or whatever. I was aghast when I heard that they originally planned to bring back Mark Strong in this very same film after his noble sacrifice. One of the best moments of the film. I love Mark Strong, love him as Merlin, and I love this scene, the whole bagpipes cover of Country Road is awesome. It's such a genuinely impactful moment, and they were originally going to bring him back for the wedding scene at the end in the crowd with prosthetic legs. Like, what? How could you just undo that emotional impact in the same damn film? I think it was really wise to pull back from that in this film. I would have felt so cheated, and I, I guess thinking of it from the filmmaker's perspective, like obviously they don't want the audience to come away feeling cheated or angry or, or whatever, like presumably they thought that we would be 
relieved. Like, oh great, Mark Strong's character's alive and he can just come back for the next one. Which again is just, it's a kind of mentality that I kind of struggle to gel with with these films. Just as an aside, from some of the behind the scenes footage and photos, you can actually tell where Mark Strong was sat when they filmed this stuff. And it's kind of funny to see in the film how they just CG'd some other guy's head onto his body. It explains why this random moustached Scottish man is sat with all the principal characters and Eggsy's mum for the wedding scene at least. Anyway, I do think it's important to remember that Matthew Vaughan is a producer as well as a director. He has Marv films and I think it's important to remember that he's a businessman as well as a filmmaker because I feel like every time he has a new film come out he'll be doing press for it and talking about how there's going to be 22 sequels and there's going to be spin-offs and what have you and that was clearly what was on his mind when he decided to introduce the Statesman organization in this film. Now I do actually really love the concept of the Statesman and I think broadening the horizon of Kingsman to see what similar organizations look like around the globe is a stroke of genius quite frankly and I think that the team they assemble for this film, Jeff Bridges, Halle Berry, Channing Tate and Pedro Pascal, it's a really impressive ensemble. Problem is, other than Pedro Pascal, I don't feel like any of the others are really given all that much to do. It feels like they are exclusively here as set up for a Statesman film that I don't think we're ever really going to get. And yeah, I know that Matthew Vaughan, uh, however many years ago, did say that, oh yeah, it's not going to be a Statesman film anymore, they're retooling it to work as a TV show, but it's just been so many years now that I just don't think we're ever gonna get that spin-off. Ultimately, I just feel a bit sorry for the actors who are being lured into this world with the promise of, well, we'll give you more to do in the next one, but I'm not sure that that'll ever really come to fruition. And don't even get me started on how Emily Watson is totally wasted in this film. I guess to give an idea of the broader stakes on a world stage level is why we have these cutaways to the President of the United States, played by Bruce Greenwood, who is actually totally fine with Poppy killing all of the drug users in the world. It means that he actually would achieve what a lot of politicians say they'll do and solve their respective country's drug problem. Uh, Emily Watson is here as the White House Chief of Staff and it turns out that she's been using Poppy's products and we follow her being rounded up along with a bunch of other civilians being placed into CGI mass jail hell and again this is a very long film for what it is and I could totally do without all of these cutaways despite my love of this particular actress. I guess functionally it explains why the US President isn't going to meet Poppy's demands so it's ultimately up to the Kingsman to sort it out and this is very similar to the first film where we understand that civilians cannot rely on their elected officials because they're all corrupt and only the Kingsman can be relied upon to do the right thing and save the world but the first film achieved it with so much more brevity and even made a gag out of it using an Obama look-alike. Uh, here it's just a weird disconnected feeling little subplot. I'm very aware that I've spent an awful lot of this video, <laughs> you know, I started off by saying oh it's a film that I really like and then I've done, you know, all, all this griping uh, so I am going to backpedal a bit because I honestly do find as a movie experience the Golden Circle to be on par with the first Kingsman film. When I am watching the Golden Circle with a drink in hand on a Friday night, for a couple of hours I am thoroughly entertained. I think that so many of the ingredients here are wonderful. I just don't think they necessarily come together to make all that satisfying a burger. The Golden Circle made a lot of money at the box office, only slightly less than the first film, so it wouldn't surprise me if we do eventually get a third film to wrap up the Eggsy story in the Kingsman universe, but given the lack of apparent enthusiasm for The King's Man and Argyle, that likelihood diminishes, I feel, year on year. I don't think Kingsman needs to become a sprawling cinematic universe, which I, I mentioned that The Golden Circle at the start of this review had a different MO to the first film, and this is it. Like, I don't feel like the first film was striving to be anything more than just a rollicking fun couple of hours. Golden Circle is clearly laying groundwork for expansion and I think and feel that Kingsman should just be a series of episodic spy adventures centered around Eggsy and when the Golden Circle is doing that I'm having an absolute blast. It's only afterwards when I come away and I start thinking about it that I'm like yeah that character did nothing and then oh yeah that person was pointless and why did we waste 10 minutes with that character when they contributed precisely zero to save the day. I think that Taron Egerton is a wonderfully charming, charismatic lead, Julianne Moore is a fabulous, outlandish villain, and the action sequences are inventive, creative, and just a joy to experience. It's funny, it's outrageous, just a, just a really <laughs> enjoyable movie experience. I think that there probably is a version of this film edited down to about 
100 minutes that I would just adore. As it stands, though, it's a film of mixed emotions for me. Lots of things that I love, lots of hang-ups that I have, so ultimately it's a... 7 out of 10 movie experience, if I had to sum it up. Praise indeed, then, I guess. Do let me know in the comment section below what you think of The Golden Circle, and specifically if you think we're ever going to get a third film to kind of wrap up the whole Taron Egerton Eggsy story, or whether you think that the sun has truly gone down on this particular story strand. Also below, please do click the subscribe button and the Mrs. Bell notification button if you haven't already to stay up to date on future video uploads, including a video review of The King's Man, which I am hoping to get to sometime in the near future. There are links to my various social medias down there too, so do follow me on those various platforms if you care to do so. And with all that being said, and until next time, both fans of Oxfords and Brogues, so long for now.